Good morning. Uh, are we doing okay? Not that hungover, I hope. I think it's um, I think it's probably the most expensive hangover that I've had <laughs> in a while. Uh, anyways, uh, my name is Lynn Root. Um, I am a staff engineer at Spotify. Um, I've been at Spotify for uh, nearly six years. Um, but since the beginning of the year, I've been uh, working on uh, building uh, machine learning infrastructure uh, for like really smart people that do um, digital signal processing and like need to productionize that. Um, it's pretty fun. Um, so if anyone here like uses Apache Beam or does streaming with data pipelines, I'd love to chat afterwards. Um, I'm also um, Spotify's FOSS evangelist. Um, I help a lot of teams with their um, projects and tools um, to get them open source under um, the Spotify GitHub organization. Um, and lastly, I am uh, one of the global leaders of Pi Ladies, um, which is a mentorship group for uh, women and friends to help increase diversity in the Python community. Um, I brought a lot of stickers with me, so if you want a Pi Ladies sticker, come find me. <laughs> One random clap, thank you. <laughs> um, all right, so this is the agenda for today. Um, it doesn't look it, but it's a bit jam-packed. Um, I'm going to be covering some uh, graceful shutdowns, exception handling, and threading, um, along with uh, testing, debugging, and profiling. Um, I'll use probably most of my time, if not all. Um, so I won't take any questions, um, but we can go outside afterwards and, and talk. Um, and this presentation is very code heavy, um, but don't worry, the slides um, for everything, the, the full write-up and the code is, is at this link, and I'll show it again uh, at the end. Okay. So async I.O., right, the concurrent uh, Python programmer's dream. Uh, it's the answer to everyone's asynchronous prayers, right? Uh, the async I.O. module has various layers um, of abstraction, allowing developers as much control as they need and are comfortable with. Um, simple hello world-like examples do show how, uh, how it can be so simple, um, but it's easy to get lulled into a false sense of security. And uh, these sort of hello world examples aren't that helpful. <laughs> we're, uh, we're led to believe that we can do a lot with um, the structured async and await API layer. Uh, some tutorials, while great for the developer to get their toes wet, um, try to illustrate real world examples, but are actually just beefed up hello world um, examples. Um, some tutorials even misuse uh, the async IO interface, um, allowing one to easily fall into the depths of callback hell. Um, and there are uh, some tutorials that will get you easily up and running uh, with async IO, but then uh, you may not realize that it's not exactly correct or not what you want, um, or it only gets you part of the way there. Um, and while some tutorials and walkthroughs um, do uh, a lot to improve upon the basic like hello world use case, um, maybe it's just uh, still just a web crawler. Um, and I'm not sure about others, but I'm not really building web crawlers at Spotify. Um, I've built services that do need to make a lot of HTTP requests, sure, and they need to be non-blocking. Uh, but these services of mine, um, they also have to react to PubSub events um, to measure progress of actions initiated from those PubSub events, um, handle any incomplete actions or other external errors, um, deal with PubSub um, message lease management, um, and measure service level indicators and send metrics. And we need to do this with uh, non-async I.O. friendly uh, dependencies. So for me, my problem got difficult quickly. Um, so allow me to provide you a real world example that actually comes from the real world. Um, has anyone heard of uh, Netflix's Chaos Monkey? I see some hands. Um, so a few years ago um, at Spotify, we built um, something similar, like a chaos creating service. Uh, that does uh, periodic hard restarts of our entire fleet of instances. And so we're going to do the same here. Uh, we're going to build a service called Mayhem Mandrill, a little pun off Chaos Monkey, um, which we will listen for a PubSub message and restart a host based off of that message. And so as we build this service, I'll point out uh, best practices that I may or may not have realized when first using async IO. And this will essentially become the type of resource that Passlin would have wanted about like three years ago. Um, and again, don't worry about the code in the slides. I'll have a link uh, referred, um, that refers to all the code at the end. Um, so we're going to start with some foundational code. 
Um, we're gonna write a, a simple publisher. Um, so here's where we're gonna start. We have a while true loop. Um, we have a unique ID for each message to publish to our queue. Uh, I want to highlight that we're not going to await uh, the queue.put of a message. Um, AsyncIO.create task will actually schedule the coroutine on the loop without blocking the rest of our for loop. Uh, the create uh, task method does return a task object, but um, we can also use it as sort of a fire and forget mechanism. If we added the await here, everything after this uh, within the published coroutine will be blocked. Um, this isn't an issue with our current setup, um, it, but it could be if uh, we were to limit the size of our queue, uh, then that await would be awaiting on uh, space to free up um, in the queue. So um, we're just gonna stick with the async IO create task. So we have a, a publisher coroutine function um, and now we need a similar consumer. Um, so this consumer will consume the messages that we've published. It's sort of similar to the publisher. Uh, we have a while true loop and a wait on the queue for a message. Uh, but here we don't want to create a task of, of queue.get. Uh, it makes sense to block the rest of the coroutine on this because there isn't much to do if, we, if there are no messages to consume. I want to highlight this again. We're only blocking within the uh, scope of the consume coroutine. Um, we're not blocking the actual event loop. So um, let's replace asyncio.sleep with a function that will restart a host. Um, I'm sure it looks like I'm just like pushing the simulation of IO work uh, to the restart uh, host function, but in doing so, I'm actually able to create a task um, out of it. So therefore we're not blocking on awaiting for more messages. Um, perhaps we want to do more than one thing per message. Um, for example, in addition to restarting a host, uh, maybe we'd like to store that message in a database for potential replaying um, later as well. Um, so we'll make use of async.io.create task again for the save coroutine to schedule on the loop, basically checking it over to the loop to execute when it can. Um, and in this example, uh, the two tasks of restarting and saving don't need to depend on one, on one another. Uh, I'm completely sidestepping the potential concern or complexity of should we restart a host if we can't save to the database and vice versa. But maybe you um, actually want your work to happen serially. Um, you, may not, um, you may not want to have concurrency for some asynchronous tasks. Uh, so for instance, maybe you uh, restart hosts that have an uptime of more than seven days. Um, so this is similar to like within banking, you should check the balance of an account before you actually debit it. Um, so needing code to be uh, serial or sequential to have steps or dependencies, it doesn't mean that you can't be asynchronous. The await last restart date will yield to the loop, but that doesn't mean that restart host will be the next thing uh, on that loop, that, that the loop executes. It will just allow um, other things to happen outside of this coroutine. So with that in mind, um, I will just put all this message related logic into a separate coroutine uh, so we don't block the consumption of messages. Um, saving a message shouldn't um, block a restart, a host if needed, so, um, we'll, so we'll return to it being a task. Um, and then we're just going to remove the uptime check um, and just restart hosts indiscriminately because why not? Uh, so we pulled the message from the queue um, and found, found out work based off of that message. Um, and now we need to perform like finalization work on that message. Um, so often um, with PubSub technologies, if you don't acknowledge a message within a predefined time frame, it will get redelivered. So for a finalization task, um, we should acknowledge the message so it isn't redelivered. We currently um, have two separate tasks, uh, save and restart host, and we want to make sure that they are both done before the message is cleaned up. Uh, we could go back to the sequential awaits, since that's a very direct way of uh, manipulating the ordering. Um, but we can also use uh, callbacks on a completed task. Uh, what we therefore want is somehow to have a task that wraps around the two coroutines of like save and restart host, since we have to wait for both to finish before we can clean, before cleaning up can happen. Uh, we can make use of asyncio.gather, which returns a future-like object um, to which we can attach the callback of cleanup via add done 
uh, callback. We can now just await that feature in order to kick off the save and restart host coroutines. Um, and then obviously the callback of cleanup will be called once those two are done. And so visualizing this a bit, you can see that both the save um, and the restart coroutine are complete. And then the cleanup um, will be called to signify that the message is actually completely done. And um, we've also maintained appropriate concurrency. Now, I don't know about you, but I have an allergy to callbacks. So um, perhaps we also need um, cleanup to be non-blocking. And so then we can just actually um, await clean after awaiting gather itself, um, which I think is um, much cleaner looking. So to quickly review, um, async IO is, is pretty easy to use, but being easy doesn't um, being easy to use doesn't automatically mean that you're using it correctly. You can't just throw around async and await keywords um, around blocking code. Sort of a, a, a shift in a mental paradigm, both within needing to think about what work can be farmed out and let it do its thing, and then what dependencies are there and where code might still need to be uh, sequential. But having your steps within your code, like um, having first A, then B, and then C, may seem like it's blocking uh, when it's not. Um, se sequential co code can still be asynchronous. Um, for instance, um, I might have, um, have to call customer service for something um, and wait to be taken off hold for them. Um, but while I wait, I can put the phone on speaker and like pet my super needy cat. So I might be single-threaded as a person, but I can still like multitask. Um, so often, um, you'll want your service to uh, gracefully shut down if it receives a signal of some sort, like cleaning up open database connections, um, stop consuming new messages, finish responding to current requests while not accepting any new requests, that kind of thing. So if we happen to restart an instance of our own service, um, we should probably clean up the mess that we've made before exiting completely out. So um, here's some typical boilerplate code to get um, the service running. Uh, we have a queue instance, um, setting up the loop, uh, scheduling the, pub, uh, the publish and the consume tasks, um, and then starting the event loop. Uh, maybe you even catch uh, the commonly known like keyboard interrupt exception. Um, so if we run it as is and then send it um, the int um, term or int single, um, we see that we do get to that accept and that finally block with these two log lines. However, um, if we send our program a signal other than sigint, like sig term, uh, we see that we don't actually reach that finally clause um, where we're logging that we're and we're closing up the loop. Um, it should also be pointed out that even if we were to only ever expect a sigint signal or a keyboard interrupt signal, um, it could happen outside of the catching of exception, uh, potentially causing the service to end up in an incomplete or otherwise unknown state. So instead of catching um, keyboard interrupt, we can use um, a signal handler on the loop itself. So first we define um, our shutdown behavior, a coroutine, that will be responsible for doing all of our unnecessary shutdown tasks. Um, here I'm just like closing database connections, returning messages as not act so that they can be redelivered and not dropped. Um, and then cleaning up or collecting all outstanding tasks except for the shutdown task itself and then canceling them. Now we don't necessarily need to cancel pending tasks. Um, we could just collect them and allow them to finish. Um, we may also want to take this opportunity to flush um, any collected metrics so that they're not lost. So then let's add our shutdown coroutine function to uh, the event loop. So the first thing we do is, is set up our loop first um, and then add our signal handler with the desired signals that we want to respond to and then remove the keyboard interrupt. So then running this again, um, we actually do see that we get to that finally clause. Now, you might be wondering which um, signals to react to, um, and apparently there is no standard. Um, basically, you should be aware of how you're running your service and handle accordingly. Um, it seems like it could get particularly messy with um, conflicting signals and when adding Docker to the mix. Another misleading API um, in async.io is the shield method. 
And so the docs say that it's meant to shield a future from cancellation. But if you have a coroutine that must not be canceled during shutdown, um, asyncio.shield will not help you. Um, so this is because the task in asyncio.shield creates, uh, creates like the task that gets created gets included in asyncio.all tasks, um, and therefore receives the cancellation signal um, just like the rest, rest of the tasks. So to help illustrate this a little bit, I have a simple like uh, async function um, with a long sleep uh, that uh, then like finally logs uh, a line saying done. Um, and we want to shield it from cancellation. So as per the docs, we have like a parent coroutine shielding the coroutine to get canceled. Um, and so the, the task that is running, the parent task that is running the shielded coroutine, um, if, that's, if that's canceled, it, it shouldn't affect the uh, shielded coroutine. Um, and so then we add uh, our parent tasks to our um, main sort of function. And then when we're running this and interrupting it after a second, uh, we see that we don't actually get to the done log line and that it's immediately canceled. Even if our shutdown coroutine function um, skips canceling the shielded coroutine or even the parent tasks, um, it still ends up getting canceled. Um, so basically, we don't really have any nurseries uh, in AsyncIO core to um, clean ourselves up. Um, it is upon us to, um, to be responsible and close up uh, connections and files that were open, uh, respond to outstanding requests, basically leave things how we found them. Doing our cleanup in the finally uh, clause isn't enough, though, um, since a signal could be sent outside of the try accept clause. So as we construct our loop, um, we should tell how the loop should be deconstructed as soon as possible in the program to ensure that all of our bases are covered. Um, we also want to be aware of um, when our program could be shut down, um, which is uh, closely tied to how we run our program. If it's a manual script, uh, then SIGINT is fine. But if it's like a demonized, within a demonized Docker container, uh, then SIG term might be more appropriate. And then finally, if you use Shield in a service that has um, a signal handler, you should be, um, be aware of its uh, funky behavior. Um, so you might have noticed that we're not doing um, any handling of exceptions so far. Um, let's revisit our uh, coroutine, uh, or our restart host coroutine. And we're going to add like a super realistic exception. So running this, um, we do see that the super serious exception is raised, um, but we actually get a task exception was never retrieved. Um, this is, pro this is um, because we don't properly handle uh, the result of the task when it raises. Um, what we can do is define sort of a, a global exception handler. This is super simple or super like sim simplified, um, and then uh, attach it to our loop, um, similar to uh, signal handling. And so if we were to rerun this, um, we do see that uh, that logging of exception that we are actually handling that. Um, but perhaps um, you want to treat exceptions um, more like specifically from certain tasks. Um, it's good to have a, uh, exception handling on the global level, um, but also on a more specific level. So let's revisit our handle message coroutine. Uh, say, for instance, you're fine with lo just logging when a save message fails, but you want to knack or not acknowledge the pub sub message and put it back to the queue if, uh, uh, in re to retry the whole message if restart fails. Um, so since um, asyncio.gather returns results, uh, we can add um, more of a fine grain exception handler to this. Um, and handle the results as we wish. I want to highlight that setting return exceptions to true is um, super imperative here. Um, otherwise, exceptions will be handled by the default handler that is set. So um, be sure that there's some sort of exception handling, either globally, individually, or, or a mix, um, most probably a mix. Otherwise, exceptions may go unnoticed um, or cause weird behavior. I also personally like using asyncio.gather because the order of returned results are deterministic, um, but it's easy to get tripped up with it. Uh, by default, it will swallow exceptions, but happily continue working on other tasks that were given. 
Um, if the exception is never returned, then weird behavior can happen. All right, um, sometimes you need to work with threads. And I'm sorry. <laughs> Just like a threaded PubSub, um, like a threaded PubSub client. Um, and you might want to consume a message on one thread um, and then handle the message within, um, within a coroutine on the main event loop. So let's first attempt to use the async IO API that we're familiar with and update our synchronous callback function with uh, creating a task via, via async .create task uh, from the handle message coroutine that we defined earlier. Um, and then we uh, call our um, uh, threaded consume function uh, via the thread pool executor. Um, but we don't get very far. Um, at this point, we're in another thread, and there's no uh, loop running on that thread. It's only on the main thread. So if we take what we have right now and update our function to um, use the main event loop, um, we actually do get it working, or it looks like it worked. Um, but it's, this is deceptive. Um, we're sort of lucky that it works. Um, some folks can probably already see that we're not being thread safe. So instead of a loop.create task, um, we should be using AsyncIO's uh, thread safe API, the run coroutine thread safe. Um, it can be difficult to tell when you're not being thread safe, particularly when it looks like it works, um, as it did in our previous attempt. Um, but in a bit, um, I'll actually show you how to easily surface um, when there's an issue of thread safety. So my opinion, it isn't too difficult to work with um, threaded code in async IO, uh, particularly or similarly to how we work with non-async code in the async world. Uh, we just make use of the thread pool executor, um, which essentially uh, creates an awaitable for us. Um, however, it's difficult to work with both threads and async IO um, when there's some sort of shared state between, um, a, th between a thread and the main loop. And, and so if you must, uh, then use the thread safe APIs that async IO gives you. Um, it took me an embarrassingly long time to realize that this existed. Um, all right, now on to testing. Um, so for a more simplistic uh, starting point, we're going to test um, async IO code before we introduce threading. So to start simple, we're gonna test the uh, save coroutine using PyTest. Since um, sa save is a coroutine, our test will need to run the coroutine in the event loop. Um, so like so, which uh, uh, Python 3.7 uh, makes it easy for us with async.io.run. Um, or with older Python 3 versions, um, we have to construct and deconstruct the loop um, yourself. But there is um, a better way. So there's a PyTest plugin called PyTest async.io that will essentially do that um, hard work for you. Um, Oops, and then all you need to do is mark the particular tasks that are testing async code with a decorator from that plugin, um, as well um, as make, make it so that the test function itself is actually a coroutine function. Um, so now when running the test, the plugin will essentially do the work for you of constructing and deconstructing the event loop. Um, the PyTest uh, async IO plugin um, will get, can get you pretty far, uh, but it doesn't help you when you need to mock out coroutines. Um, so, uh, for instance, our save coroutine function calls another coroutine function, um, the async IO dot sleep, or, or maybe some actual call to a database. Uh, you don't actually want to wait for async IO dot sleep to complete, or you don't actually want um, a connection to the database to happen. Um, so both the unit test dot mock and the pytest mock libraries do not support asynchronous mocks, um, so we're going to have to work around this a bit. Um, so first, uh, we do make use of the PyTest mock library, and we create a PyTest fixture that is essentially returning a function. Um, the outer function itself returns the inner function as a fixture that we'll use in our tests. Um, and then the inner function is basically creating and returning a mock object um, that we'll use in our test, as well as a stub coroutine uh, that, will, that the mock will end up calling. It also patches, if needed, um, the coroutine function with the um, stub so we can avoid uh, network calls, sleeps, et cetera. So then we're going to create another PyTest uh, Py fixture that will use the 
create Coro mock fixture to mock and patch um, async.io.sleep. Um, we don't need the stub coroutine um, that it returns, um, so we can just essentially throw that away. And then we're going to use the mock sleep fixture in our test save function. So what we've done here basically is patched async.io.sleep with our um, um, within our Mayhem module uh, with the stub coroutine function. Then we just assert that the mock uh, mocked async io.sleep object is called when um, mayhem.save is called. Um, because now we have a mock object instead of an actual coroutine, we can do anything that is supported with your standard mock objects, like assert called once with setting return values and side effects. So it's pretty simple, I guess, ish. Um, but um, maybe you want to test um, code that has uh, that calls create task, um, and we can't simply use the create code or mock fixture, however, with this. Um, for instance, let's revisit our um, consume coroutine, which uh, creates and schedules a task on the loop um, out of handle message. Um, we first need to create a couple of fixtures um, on the uh, for the queue that gets passed in. Uh, first, we'll mock and patch um, async IO queue class in our module. And then we'll use that mock queue fixture in another one, a mock get fixture. So unlike our mock sleep fixture, we will use the uh, stub coroutine that create co or mock returns um, and then set it to the mock queue get um, method. So here's our test consume function um, where we're giving our newly created fixtures. Um, so let's try to use the create co or mock to mock and um, and patch the call to handle message uh, via coroutine, uh, coroutine via create task. Um, note that we're setting um, the mock get side effect to one real value and one exception to make sure that we're not permanently stuck in that while loop. And, I want, and finally, we want to assert that the mock uh, for handle message has been called after our consume um, has been run. So when running this, um, we see that um, mock handle message is not actually called like we're expecting. And this is because the scheduled tasks are only scheduled at this point and impending, and, and we sort of need to nudge them along. So we can do this um, by calling, um, collecting all running tasks, um, that is not the test itself, and running them explicitly. And this is a bit clunky, I know. Um, if you use the uh, uh, unit test from standard library, um, there is a package called um, async test that handles this better. Um, and exhausts uh, the scheduled tasks for you. So I hear that you're wanting like 100% test coverage, which is great, um, but it might be difficult uh, for our main function. Uh, we need to set up signal handling and exception handling, um, and we need to create a few tasks and then start and close the loop. Uh, we can't exactly use the event loop fixture that PyTest async IO library gives us as it is now. Um, we need to sort of uh, manip manipulate the event loop uh, that um, PyTest async.io will use to when it injects it into the tested code. Um, so what we do um, is update the testing event loop. Um, we can override the close behavior. Um, if we close the loop during the test, we will lose access to the ex um, exception and signal handlers that we set up within the main function. Um, so we actually want to close the loop after we're done with the test. Um, and then, then we can also um, use uh, the mock to assert that our main function actually closes the loop. So now we'll write a, a test main function that actually borders on like an integration or functional test. Um, we want to make sure that in addition to expecting calls to publish and consume, that shutdown gets called when expected. But we can't exactly mock out shutdown with a create coro mock um, since it will patch it will patch it with just another coroutine and therefore uh, run the mocked coroutine each time it receives a signal rather than canceling the tasks and stopping the loop. Um, so instead, we're going to mock out um, what's called with the uh, shutdown coroutine, the asyncio.gather. And then here I'm starting a thread that will actually send um, the process a signal after a tenth of a second. And so after the starting the thread, we, the, we then called a uh, main function that we want to test. Um, so looking at the second half of the test, um, we can assert that the loop setup is the way that we expected, as well as our mocked out functions um, having been called. 
Um, returning to the, the setup, the, the first half of the test, um, here you might want to parameterize the test function itself um, to test not just the SIGINT signal, um, but all the signals that we're expecting. Um, and probably test um, with a signal that you're not um, expecting, um, like a SIG user or something like that. Um, so basically, uh, the TLDR of, of using Py is to use PyTest async IO. Um, there's also a package called async test uh, for a unit test um, that functions similarly to uh, PyTest async IO. Um, and the bonus is that it will exhaust the, um, the task schedule in a loop for you automatically, as well as um, provide coroutine mocks. Um, so, all right, we're uh, decent programmers and have uh, code coverage, but sometimes shit breaks, um, and we need to figure out what's going on. And we can use everyone's favorite debugger, uh, printing, even if you won't admit it. Um, so if you have like one tiny little thing to debug, um, you can use the print stack method on the instance. Um, and so when, when you run this, um, it will print the stack for you um, for each running task. Um, you can also increase uh, the number of frames um, that are printed as well. Um, but you probably will actually use, uh, will need to use AsyncIO's debug mode uh, within the standard library itself. So along with uh, setting our logging level to debug, um, we can easily turn on AsyncIO's debug mode while we run our script. Um, if we didn't have a proper exception handling setup, uh, we'd get information about which task is affected um, and also uh, what's what is called a source traceback that gives us more um, context uh, in addition to like our normal traceback. Um, so without debug mode, uh, we get told that there's an exception that's not properly handled, but with debug mode, uh, it gives us an additional clues as to what's, what might be going on and where they might be. Um, another very uh, handy thing that I wish um, I knew of a few years ago um, is that if you have threads and event loop interacting with each other, um, debug mode will surface um, b not being thread safe um, as, as a runtime error and just quit out. Super helpful. Um, one also uh, a really nice feature about um, async IO's debug mode is how it kind of acts like a tiny profiler that will log async calls that are slower than 100 milliseconds. Um, so we can uh, fake a coroutine by putting a blocking call to uh, uh, with uh, time.sleep. And so when we run the script, um, we can see that um, it will surface um, slow to finish tasks, potentially highlighting an un unnecessarily blocking call. Um, the default for what's considered slow is 100 milliseconds, but that is uh, easily configurable too. You can set it directly on the loop with slow uh, callback duration. Um, in seconds um, on the loop directly itself. Um, so much like uh, some people's testing philosophies, sometimes we want to debug in production, um, because why not? Um, but usually you don't want full on debug mode while in production. So there's this lightweight package um, called uh, AIO debug um, that will log slow callbacks for you. Um, and it also uh, comes with the ability to report delayed calls, calls to StatsD if, if you use StatsD. And so that, that's all what this library does. So it's super lightweight and, and quite handy. So you can easily uh, print the stack of a task if needed, um, but you do get a lot with async IO's debug mode. Um, it gives more information around unhandled exceptions, when you're not being thread safe, and when there are slow to complete tasks. And if you want to understand um, slow tasks while in production, AIO debug is a lightweight library that essentially does only that. As we saw with async IO debugs, debug mode, the event loop can already track uh, coroutines that take up too much CPU time to execute. Um, but it might be hard to tell when it's an anomaly or, when it, or what is a pattern. Um, so a lot of folks might first reach for a C profile when trying to understand performance. And we can try that here, too. Um, but there isn't that much to glean from this. Um, the top item here is essentially the event loop itself. Um, and even if we looked at our own code specifically, um, you can kind of get a picture of what's going on, but it doesn't immediately surface any bottlenecks or particularly slow areas. Um, our, of course, our main function would have the most uh, time cumulatively, since that's where the event loop is ran. 
but nothing is um, immediately obvious. So I re recently discovered uh, Kcash Grind, even though it's been around for a while, but you can use it with uh, Python. Um, and to do so, we first save the output of C profile and then use this package um, called pyprof to call tree, which takes the output of C profile and converts the data into something that Kcash Grind can understand. Um, and so um, when the, sc the script is ran, uh, you're met with this um, UI. And it, it's OK if you can't make anything out. But basically, on the left-hand side, uh, there's a profiling data that we would otherwise see from the output of C profile. And then the two sections on the right uh, shows information about callers and callees, um, including a call graph, which is on the bottom, and um, a map of the callees, um, which is uh, on the top. Yeah. Um, if we limit our view to only our script and like start clicking around, um, we can start to get an idea of where time is most spent. Uh, the visualization groups modules together by color. Um, and so when I first ran uh, the service, I noticed there's a lot of blue um, on the Kali map that's on the top there. And if you click into that blue, um, it's actually uh, logging. That's taking a lot of time. I'm going to go back to that um, point in a second. Um, so Kcash Grind allows us to get a broad picture of what's going on and gives us visual clues um, of where to look for potential areas of unnecessary time spent. Um, but then there's the line profiler package, and we can use it to hone in on areas uh, of our code that we're suspicious of. So after installing the profiler, uh, you can add a profile decorator where you want to profile. Here I'm just decorating the save code routine for now. Uh, the line profiler library comes with a to tool um, called kernprof uh, that we will invoke our script with. And then we render the output of line profiler itself. Um, and this is uh, a line by line assessment of our decorated code. The total time spent in this function is just over two milliseconds. Um, and the majority of that time was spent in logging. Um, now, if only there was something we can do about that. Um, coincidentally, someone uh, has uh, done something about it. Um, there's a package called AIO Logger that allows for non-blocking logging. So if we switch out our default logger with AIO Logger and rerun line profiler, uh, we can see that our total time spent in that function has halved, um, as well as time spent while logging. So certainly these are like minuscule improvements that we're doing here. Um, and there's probably a lot more that we, we can do. But if you imagine this sort of on a larger scale, we could probably save a lot of time. Um, and also, as I see it, if we have an event loop, let's try and take full advantage of it. Uh, so we've profiled using C profiler and line profiler, um, but we had to stop the service in order to look at results. Um, so perhaps you'd like a live profiler along with your production testing and debugging, if you do that. Uh, there's a package called Profiling that provides an interactive UI, and it supports async I.O. as well as threads and greenlets. Granted, you can't attach to an already running process with this particular tool. Um, you'll need to, to launch a service with it. Um, and when you do, you get this uh, text-based UI that um, regularly updates. Um, you can drill down, you can pause it while inspecting something and restart it. Um, you're able to save performance data to view it um, with this UI at a later time. And also provides, um, the tool provides a server which you can then remotely connect to it. Um, so the TLDR of profiling, there isn't much difference uh, with profiling async IO code from non-async IO code. It can be a little confusing though with looking at C profile output. Um, to get an initial picture of um, your, service, your service's uh, performance, using a C profiler with Kcash Grind can help surface um, areas to investigate. Um, without that visualization, um, we saw that it can be a bit difficult to, s to see the hotspots. Um, once you have an idea of those hotspot areas, you can use a line profiler to get a line-by-line -line, um, performance data. And finally, if you want to profile, or profile in production, um, I suggest taking a look at the profiling package. Um, so in essence, um, this talk is something that I would have liked um, a year ago, speaking to Paslin here. Um, but I'm hoping that, that there are others who can benefit from a use case that is not a web crawler. Um, th this is the link to the full blog post, the slides, and all the code. Um, and I must give my obligatory spiel um, where uh, Spotify is hiring for various engineering and data science positions um, at all of our engineering offices. Um, 
Stockholm, London, New York, and Boston. So if you're interested, you can come talk to me. Um, and thank you very much. Thank you.